A very good day to you. Once again, it's just wonderful to be in the forest, in the quietness. There is not a breath of air. The cameraman and the sound men are so happy. <laughs> They've got no problems today. Folks, I want to ask you a question. If you had to die today, are you sure that you know where you would be going? Some of you say, yeah, of course I'm going to heaven. Are you sure? What qualifies you to go to heaven before somebody else? Now, the reason why I'm sharing this with you is because last week I got an SMS in the early hours of the morning from one of my spiritual sons from overseas, and it was a heart-rendering SMS. Dear Dad, it said, I'm his spiritual father. Dear Dad, my heart is broken. One of my best friends, he said, we spent time together, we grew up together, we lived together as young men, has just been tragically killed. And then he says in his SMS, but dad, I'm not really as heartbroken about the fact that my friend has died. What is breaking my heart is I'm not sure where he is today. You see, dad, I'd been talking to him about the Lord, but... I'm not sure whether he made a commitment to Christ. My dear friend, we do not have time left to waste. If you go to the Word of God, to the book of John, chapter 4 and verse 35, a, a verse that you and I know very well, but we need to read it again in detail. Jesus says, Do you not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest. Question mark. The Lord says, Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. It is harvest time now like never before. I know I've been preaching this message for over 30 years, but I want to say to you, after I read that um, SMS, from that young man, my heart also is challenged. Am I telling people about the fact that they need to be born again? Am I telling people that they need to be saved? Am I telling people about the shortage of time? My dear friend, we seem to be talking about everything else these days, but that very fact that unless a man is born again, John chapter 3 and verse 3, and verse 7, he will not see the kingdom of heaven. What I'm telling you this right now, there might be a Nicodemus watching this program and saying, Angus, what do you mean about being born again? How can a grown man re-enter his mother's womb again? Jesus was faced with the exact same question posed to him by one of the most intelligent men in Israel in those days, a member of the Sanhedrin, the governing body of the uh, Israeli people. Jesus says that unless you are born again, you will never see the kingdom of heaven. How can that be? The Lord says, you don't know where the wind comes from. You don't know where the wind's going, but you know there's wind. And I tell you the truth. What Jesus meant is unless you and I start living a godly life, unless we start again, we will never see the kingdom of heaven. Unless we put Jesus Christ first and foremost in our lives, we will not see home. I want to say this again. Good people do not go to heaven. Believers go to heaven. Angus, how can you say that? Very simply, because I was and I'm still not a good man, but I do believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And by His grace, I am endeavoring to walk and to live a Christian life. If it's good people that are going to heaven, I'm telling you that there will be people from other religions getting to heaven long before we do. It's not about being good. It's about believing. You see, the early church, people were not called Christians. That term Christian came from uh, Emperor Constantine. He was the one who decided to call us Christians. We were known as believers. We were actually known as the people of the way. Now, if you look at John chapter 14, verse 6, the Lord says, I am the way 
and the truth and the life. And no one goes to the Father but by me. It's by faith in Jesus Christ alone that you and I are saved. So why are we not telling people they must believe? Why are we not showing people the road that leads to everlasting life? Why are we so busy talking about everything else? Folks, I'm not pointing fingers at anybody. The Holy Spirit has challenged me and I'm simply delivering the message to you. That young man said he is heartbroken. He said he had been with his friend for years. He had been telling him, but I don't know whether he's saved, he says, which means he never challenged him that you need to be born again. So what must I do? Nicodemus said that. That's why he came to Jesus by night. He never came during the day because he didn't want to become a laughing stock because Nicodemus was the holy man. Nicodemus was the theologian. He was the man that knew this book. Jesus was a carpenter from Nazareth. But when he saw the miracles and the signs and the wonders that this carpenter performed, Nicodemus knew that this man had something that I want. And that's what he said. How can a man have everlasting life? What is the way? Can you show me the way home? And that's when Jesus says you need to be born again. Friends, do not say tomorrow I will tell my loved one that he needs to make his peace with God. Don't say tomorrow. We don't have tomorrow. Yesterday's already gone, so don't cry over spilt milk, as they say, because you can't do anything about yesterday. It's finished. It's today. This is the hour. Now's the time. As I'm talking to you now, God is laying somebody on your heart. I know that. Maybe it's somebody at school. Maybe it's somebody in your workplace. Maybe it's a loved one. Maybe it's a family member. And you have not spoken to them about eternal life. And that's why there's an uneasiness in your spirit as I'm talking to you. Because we need to tell people about the way home. What I'm experiencing where I'm traveling all over the world, people are so concerned about now. Folks, it's important to look after yourself physically. It's important to discipline yourself. It's important to talk about this life and where you're going to live and um, how you're going to save up for your old age and about this pension policy and that. But you know something? If the Lord calls you home tonight, all those things will equal nothing because you are taking nothing with you from this world when you leave this world. You are going to leave this world, the Bible says, the same way you came in. And you came in with nothing and you're leaving with nothing. So what can we take with us, Angus? Souls. People. Your children. Your parents. Your loved ones. That's what you can take with you. Nothing else. So there shouldn't be anything else of a higher priority than making sure that the people around you know what it means to be saved. You say to me, Angus, prove that to me. Well, let's go to the book of Romans. I love the book of Romans. The book of Romans was written by Paul, who was probably the greatest evangelist that ever lived next to Jesus himself. Paul said in Romans chapter 10 and verse 9 onwards, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes to righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made to salvation. That's verse 10. Let's just go on a bit. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. Verse 12. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon Him. See, some people don't know who to call upon. And verse 13, for whoever, I love that scripture. It's one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible. For whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. There are people watching this program today that feel they are not qualified or not worthy to be saved. I want to tell you it's a lie from the pit of hell. The Bible says whoever means whoever. Okay? Folks, Jesus even said to the Pharisees, why do you make it so hard 
for a man to enter into the kingdom of God. Why do you make all these laws that you know a man will never keep? Well, you know, if you stop smoking, if you stop drinking, if you stop swearing, uh, then, we, then we're going to think about it. But until then, there's no hope for you. Folks, listen to me. You will never do that in your own strength, will you? Because you've tried before, haven't you? That's right. And you failed, haven't you? I know, because I did that. See, I used to think, when I get my life right, then I'll give my heart to Jesus. That will never happen. It's Jesus who makes the heart right. Jesus gives you the strength to stop smoking, stop drugging, stop drinking, get rid of that pornography, stop hating your brother, giving you a forgiveness for those who have hurt you. Jesus does all that. You can't do that. You are helpless. As I talk to you now, you are shackled by the, the devil himself because he brings unforgiveness, hatred, self-righteousness, all these things. When you give your life to the Lord, they just melt away. That's right. Because you enter into a relationship with the King of Kings. And He forgives you and He gives you the ability to forgive others. Okay? He restores you. He gives you the strength to walk away from that alcoholism. Walk away from that drug addiction. Walk away from that pornography. You understand? So we need to be born again. Why? So that we can live a new life. And that life starts here on earth. It doesn't start in heaven. Come back to that little SMS. Folks, I want to tell you, it's a terrible thing. And I, I spoke to that son of mine and I said to him, you know, <clears throat> it's already done. But I reminded him of the story of Jesus when he hung on the cross. There were two thieves, one on the one side and another on the other side. The one believed, the other one rejected. The one went to heaven, the other one went to the other place. Eternal damnation. Jesus said to that thief, literally minutes, if not seconds before he died, the thief said to the Lord, Lord, remember me in heaven. He said, you will be with me today in paradise. Why? Because he was a good man? No, he was a thief. According to the law of the, of the Romans, he deserved to die. But you know something? He confessed with his mouth, Jesus Christ. And he believed in his heart that he was going to heaven and he was saved. Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. Oh, my dear friend, you don't have to wait any longer. In a few minutes, I'm going to pray that prayer with you. That's right, I'm going to do it. I've done it thousands of times before and I want to do it thousands of times still. I want to pray that the Lord Jesus Christ will enter into your heart. I don't want one person who's watching this program to have to go to eternal damnation simply because no one was prepared to pray with them. I don't know where you are. You might be lying in a, in a prison cell. You might be in a hospital with a terminal disease. You might be away from home. You might have let the show down. You, you might be the laughing stock in your area. I don't know. Maybe you're an alcoholic. Maybe you're a drug addict. I don't know. But I know one thing. Jesus died for sinners. He didn't die for the good people. He died for the prostitute, the drug addict. I want to tell you something. Now. He died for people like me, losers. And he gave us a second chance. I'm only standing here today because of the grace that I've received from God. I do not deserve to even preach the gospel. I'm not good enough. But in Christ Jesus, I can do all things. Christ gave me new life on the 18th of February, 1900. And 79, I want to tell you, my life was changed from that day. And I want to tell you, when I gave my life to Christ, I went home. I didn't feel any different. I just knew I'd made a decision. And I want to tell you something now. The first thing that went out of my mouth was blasphemy. I had a terrible language because I've got a limited education and I battled to express myself. So I used to swear constantly. That was the first thing that just went. I've never sworn since that day. I've shouted a lot, <laughs> but I've never sworn. That was a miracle. And so no one is, is exempt, okay, from going to heaven. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I want to tell you, I enjoy preaching 
to uh, people who know they've got a problem rather than those who think that they're okay. What am I saying? I'm saying that the man who lies in the gutter because he's drunk too much and he's given up on life, that man knows he's got a problem. He's got a greater chance of going to heaven than the man that sits in the, in the pew in the church with his name printed in brass behind. That's his chair. And he goes there every single Sunday and he's got no intention of serving God. He's got a problem. He, he doesn't know that he's got a problem. Do you understand what I'm saying? What I'm saying is, unless you make a person aware that he needs to be saved, he doesn't think he's got a problem until he dies. Folks, I've told you this little story before in this program. I want to tell you again. This is my interpretation of what the Word of God tells me. On the day of judgment, our Heavenly Father will be the judge. Jesus will be the defense attorney and the prosecutor will be the devil. And when you and I walk through that door, our Heavenly Father, who's our God of compassion and love, is going to have one look at us and He's going to look at His Son and He's going to ask Jesus, our Savior, our Protector, our best friend. He's going to ask one question. He's going to look at His Son who He loves so much. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him, believes in Him, shall not perish but have everlasting life. John chapter 3, verse 16. He's going to ask that son, son, do you know that old farmer, Angus Buchan, walking through the door? And by the grace of God, Jesus is going to say, I know him, Father. He's my friend. And our Lord is going to say, let him in. If I walk through that door and I've been working all my life, I've been working in soup kitchens, I've given away millions and millions of daughters, <clears throat> I've been working my heart out, but I have never acknowledged Jesus Christ as my Savior and my Lord. When Father asks that question, Jesus is going to be, has to be honest, He's going to say, I've never met Him before, I don't know Him. And I'll tell you what, the judge, the righteous judge is going to say to the devil, take Him away, because we don't know Him. It's not about good deeds. It's about faith. Faith in what? Faith in the Son of God. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not yet seen. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1. I want to tell you that Thomas, and by the way, I love Thomas. Don't, don't you think that Thomas is condemned? Thomas is in heaven. You know why Thomas was known as the doubter? Thomas is known as the doubter because he said, unless I can put my finger through the hole in his hand where he was crucified, unless I can take my hand and put it in his side where the spear went, I will not believe that he's been resurrected. Now we can't condemn Thomas for that, folks. I heard a wonderful teaching once on Thomas. Thomas was so sincere, like a lot of you watching this program. He was so honest. He was saying, unless I can see it, I won't believe it. Okay? And then Jesus just appeared in the room in front of them. He didn't walk through the door. He appeared before him. And Thomas fell to his knees. He said, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said, you say that, Thomas, because you can see me. But blessed are those who come after you, who have not seen me, and yet they still believe. And that, my friend, is you and me. We need to believe. Maybe you even need to say on this program, Lord, please increase my faith. That's what the disciples asked, so that I can believe. Luke chapter 17, verse 5. It's a good scripture. But I want to say to you today, you do not have time left to play the fool any longer. Many of you watching this program, are know, you know exactly what I'm saying. Okay? There was a time, you can tell me, when I was in love with Jesus Christ, and maybe the church, maybe the pastor, maybe the elders, I don't know, they, they, they put me off. And I don't want to see the back of a church ever again. I'm not talking about church. I'm talking about a person. His name is Jesus Christ. And he says that if you confess with your mouth, okay, believe in your heart, you shall be saved. Now, I need to pray that prayer with you. Why? Because I want to see you in heaven one day. Because good people don't go to heaven. Believers go to heaven. 
And I don't want that, that young son of mine to be brokenhearted again because somebody else that maybe should have heard the gospel never had the opportunity because no one told him. Folks, you working in an office next to a person who does not even know that you're a believer because you've never told them. Well, Angus, that's a private thing. It's not private, folks. When a man's on his way to eternal damnation, that's not private. That is tragic. You don't know what tomorrow holds. So I'm going to pray two prayers. The first prayer I'm going to pray is for you and me to repent of our sins, to ask Jesus Christ to be Lord of our lives, okay? So that we can move on, so that we can have eternal life. And the second prayer I'm going to pray is that God will give you and me the courage of our convictions. To be able to tell that person that you're sitting next to in the aeroplane, you've got 10 or 12 hours to sit next to him. Do you know Jesus? All the person can say, I'm not interested. But at least you've given him an opportunity. What about if he hasn't heard? What an opportunity to say, listen, I want to tell you about my friend. He saved me. And uh, you can have him as well. What must I do? Just pray this prayer with me. What must a man do to eternal to inherit eternal life? He must believe. So will you pray that prayer with me? Close your eyes and let's pray. A prayer, first of all, of commitment. And then you're going to tell the first three people tomorrow what you did today. Okay? Or a prayer of recommitment. Let us pray. Father God, pray after me. Father God, I thank you for Jesus Christ. That if I confess with my mouth Jesus Christ, and I believe in my heart that he's been raised from the dead, I shall be saved. I do believe, and I ask you, Lord, to help my unbelief. I believe that you died on the cross of Calvary for a sinner like me. I believe that you were buried and you remained in that tomb for three days. But on the third day, you rose from the dead and you are seated in heaven at the right hand of my Father. I believe. And because I believe that, Lord, and because I've repented of my sin, I shall have everlasting life. Amen. May God bless you. Now the second prayer, and it's a short one. Pray this prayer after me. Lord, give me the courage of my convictions. Give me the courage to speak to my neighbor and to tell my neighbor because I am my neighbor's keeper according to Genesis 18, 14. Give me the courage to tell him the way home. In Jesus' name, amen. May God bless you. And go and do it, folks. It's a wonderful thing to see a man coming into the kingdom of God. It is an awesome experience. To see a person who's so lonely, so down and out, so hopeless, all of a sudden to see the light of life. This is not the end of the road. We're still going home. This is only the beginning of the journey. Praise God. Bless you. And remember, I'll see you there.